what I'd like to do today is just um, quickly go through a couple of the um, treatments that I have developed with my teams and then spend the bulk of the time on some new things I'm working on because really that's what's really exciting me right now. So um, a quick word on the Geron trial. You know, we had generated high purity human oligodendrocytes from embryonic stem cells for um, SCI. And those trials, as you're probably well aware, were halted uh, due to economic reasons. Safety was demonstrated in the first five patients, the first cohort. Uh, so that's a very good clinical sign. These individuals received one-tenth of the therapeutic um, volume or dose. That's an important thing to realize. It was a very cautious trial being the first embryonic stem cell trial in the world um, regulated under a uh, regulatory body. There was a great deal of challenge to that trial. A very, very high regulatory bar. And I'm not saying it shouldn't have been there. It was a good thing it was there. Very strict patient inclusion criteria. And a, um, over 20% of clinical trials are challenged to the point of halting in this nation because of patient enrollment problems. And the stricter patient inclusion criteria are, the more difficult it is to enroll patients. A very long patient follow-up, two years before advance to the next trial, and 15 years before release. That means money. Very early technologies. That includes not only the stem cells themselves, but the liquids and the substrates, and just the naivete of the US FDA in regulating this type of work. It took a great deal of time to figure out how to do an embryonic stem cell or just a stem cell approval in the United States. And fortunately, it worked. We passed that barrier, and I think that's going to facilitate, and indeed it has facilitated other stem cell work in the nation. But Geron was um, faced with a burn rate, like every company. You've got to keep your lights on and your people employed and their mortgages and rents paid. And the, these long delays translate into burn, a very, very hard thing for a company to sustain. And of course, they were under extreme scrutiny. So all these things uh, combined to generate an extraordinarily high cost of development for a very, very small market size, spinal cord injury. Nonetheless, they persevered, got it through. It's now on hold because of a uh, economic demise of the company and the program. Um, I've been very, very intimately involved in the analysis of the program since it was shut down and helping a couple of uh, groups resurrect it. Uh, it's my belief that it will be resurrected, so keep your eye on that ball. Just a quick note on the motor neuron program I started some years ago at the University of California, Irvine. Um, this trial for spinal cord disease, the idea was to go into spinal cord disease first and then injury. Um, it was placed on an active IND with the US FDA, so that's really good news. And like every cell transplant um, approach, it was placed on clinical hold. Um, it's not a terribly onerous hold, but in the meantime, what we did was went to the United Kingdom, and um, we will be applying for a uh, permission there as well as in the United States. So that's in its final legs. We've done a great deal of work with this program. I'm not going to run over right now. Some of this is published and most of it isn't because it's the stuff of companies. And, um, but the point here is that transplantation of the motor neurons into rodent models of spinal cord injury and spinal cord disease, we've been able to uh, restore arm function, leg function, respiratory function, and heart function and with multiple measures. So there's a good strong body of evidence coupled with safety. I think this is going to, in 2013, is my uh, prediction that it'll be approved for a clinical trial. And that's California Stem Cell as a sponsor. And by way of disclosure, I am the chairman of the scientific advisory board of that company. But what I'd like to talk to you about today is two new things I've been working on. So they're, they're young, um, but I'm very, very excited about it. And I'm going to be uh, using all of the experience that I've had in translating things to push this along at lightning speed. So we've started out with clinically compliant cell lines born and bred for uh, the clinic. We've started out with clinically compliant liquids and substrates and protocols. So everything that we're doing is US FDA compliant with standard operating procedures and study protocols and study reports and a very, very high bar of regulatory oversight such that this will translate fairly quickly. 
So one of the things my lab did a couple years ago was generate a neuronal progenitor cell line. This is not a neural progenitor cell line that makes astrocytes and oligodendrocytes and neurons. It only makes neurons. Uh, I published this uh, last year with Pfizer where um, they took these cells and showed that they generate a whole bunch of things, but they're all neurons and very, very few uh, astrocytes. What I decided to do in this uh, new uh, project in my lab was begin to manipulate the P10 gene. P10 is uh, just a phenomenal gene. It's one of the hottest uh, bits of news in the regenerative neuroscience today. And uh, I'm very, very pleased to be working in a team with Oz Stewart, who really brought this to my attention and has done some remarkable work uh, with Dr. He from Harvard. What we did was look at loss of function paradigms where this P10 inhibition releases a whole cascade of events that are pro-regenerative. And I won't go into detail. So we've identified a couple different inhibitors to this molecule, and we've tested out a couple different inhibitors. And um, this is the first one, the FEN, or um, BPV pen. And we can see that if we dump these things onto high purity human neuronal progenitor cells in a dish, they cause neurites to grow faster. So they, by inhibiting this molecule, it sort of supercharges them, sort of like cells on steroids, and they grow axons faster, bigger, better, stronger, and longer than untreated cells. So we can do this in a dish, and we see that this, um, using this one inhibitor, PHEN, has about a 40 or 50% increase in the amount of neurite outgrowth. If we use a different one, the PIC version of this inhibitor, it's another 100% higher than that, roughly around 80 up to 120% growth. So this does seem to work like the literature says it does in causing growth. So we did all the subsequent studies with this PIC version. If you look at the 200 nanomolar PIC, you can see that the, um, this immunostaining image shows tremendous outgrowth of axons. So neurons grow, P10 inhibited neurons grow much, much better. With the secondary neurite branching, we've also shown a tremendous effect. So you see two, six, 12, and 18 hours, you have much, much more secondary neurite growth. So not only causing the primary axon to grow, but secondaries. We can um, promote outgrowth beyond that of enhanced cyclic AMP levels. Enhancing cyclic AMP, the scientists in the crowd will know, is a, really a gold standard for enhancing neurite outgrowth. And the P10 inhibition promotes outgrowth beyond that of the cyclic AMP. And if we diminish cyclic AMP, we see the same thing. So this shows that the P10 inhibition is a little bit bigger, better, stronger than cyclic AMP alone. We confirm that this works through a particular pathway called the mTOR pathway. This is a little bit scientist geeky of us, but it won't mean a lot to uh, many of the people in the room. But we chose an, an, an inhibitor of the mTOR pathway called rapamycin that strongly blocks the C1 and weakly blocks the C2. And we showed that um, we can completely inhibit this mTOR um, um, pathway. You can see that it is completely absent in those cultures that are treated with rapamycin. And we can um, show that the P10 inhibition enhances outgrowth by means other than the mTOR alone, because when we inhibit the mTOR pathway and then add P10, it boosts it. So P10, as the literature would suggest, uh, inhibition is doing a little bit more than just working through the mTOR pathway, as would be expected. We then decided to do a transient P10 inhibition in preparing this for clinical application, because we can't be applying P10 to your body all the time. Much of the work in this field has been done using transgenic mice, and of course, we can't transgenically modify you. This whole approach is about treating a clinically compliant cell and culture in a clinically compliant fashion. So you can't go adding P10 to, to people. P10 is a tumor suppressor. It's, it's gonna cause cancers. So our idea here was to treat cells in a dish, clean it all out, and then put them in you. So we get the supercharge of the cells and the neurite outgrowth without the toxicity and um, detriment that P10 inhibitors would cause in a human. And it worked. So here we transiently inhibit P10 for 2, 6, 12, or 18 hours, 
and in all cases saw an enhancement of near eye outgrowth. You can see that at six hours or 18 hours, we got quite a, uh, an increased amount of growth. We then decided to wash it out just after the two hours. And if you wash it out after two hours and then allow them to grow for periods of time after that, you see a tremendous amount, almost a doubling of the neurite outgrowth. Now that's lost over time because um, the untreated cells catch up in the absence of growth inhibition in vitro. So our culture conditions cause neurite outgrowth. They really promote it. In your body, that doesn't happen clearly. So this is an artifact of um, uh, tissue culture. We do confirm that we can wash out the P10 and see a lasting effect on your eye outgrowth, which is important for clinical translation. And we see the same thing with a six hour washout. Um, so we can now begin to look at the toxicity profiles of this compound, and that's ongoing right now, so that we can see that this procedure is going to be clinically compliant as we move forward. We've transplanted these things into animal models and identified the cells, and we're now currently looking at neurite outgrowth. Uh, all indications are that we're getting about double the rate and extent of neurite outgrowth in vitro, but this is where we're just uh, um, gathering the data now, and I don't have anything more to show you. So I'm very excited about this approach. I think the literature on P10 is capturing the attention of regenerative neuroscientists around the world. And I think that this is a very, very clinically relevant manner of taking that very exciting technology and moving it towards the clinic. For the next uh, 10 minutes or so, I'd just like to talk about another approach entirely for the treatment of chronic spinal cord injury. And this doesn't have to do with transplanting cells, but it does use stem cell technologies. One of the greatest advancements in stem cells over the last um, decade or so has been the identification of means to make these cells from your skin. And in fact, the Nobel Prize was just awarded to Shinya Yamanaka. The Waddington's landscape, as the scientists in the crowd know, say that in development, a cell becomes more and more restricted during its development. IPS technology has been shown to take more mature cells and drive them back to embryonic. And groups like Doug Melton and others have shown that cells that have come down this lineage can actually be reprogrammed to other cell types in the body. Really a, a very wonderful technology where we may be able to take old cells like skin and make them into other cell types in your body. So it occurred to me uh, actually about 15 years ago, that I would love to be able to take the astroglial scar in, uh, in a chronic spinal cord injury and reprogram it to become a young astrocyte population. And the means did not exist until a few years ago when IPS technology developed. And we can now have the means to take one cell population and turn it into a younger version of itself. reprogramming the glial scar. I'm very, very excited about this approach and it's really the uh, focus of much of my laboratory these days. We know that glial cells support axonal growth during development. Immature cells are very highly supportive of central nervous system regeneration, whereas old um, cells, after an injury, secrete things that stop regeneration. This is not entirely true, but it's a good generalization. They also do some pro-regenerative things, these old cells, but we certainly know that they present some barriers to axonal repair. The idea here is that reprogramming mature cells into their immature counterparts will provide, will remove a source of inhibition and add pro-regenerative elements as young astrocytes are really one of the great architects of your central nervous system. They align and help everything grow. I think that there's, I could make this slide another 30 slides on justification of why this may work. What we did was we identified, um, we've started out with 30,000 genes and reduced it down to a number of genes that are typical of a young astrocyte and they're not present in an old astrocyte. And we use these things as targets to reprogram and introduce these young genes into the old astrocytes. So in effect, what we're doing is pelting the genome, pelting the cell with dozens and dozens of copies of genes that are not usually expressed in an old astrocyte. They're actually expressed in a young astrocyte, and the young astrocytes are tricked into thinking that they are young, and they actually, I'm sorry, the old astrocytes are tricked into thinking that they're young, 
back differentiate and become young. That's the goal, and I think we've managed to do it. First of all, what we had to do was establish astrocyte cultures and lentibial transduction. And like any uh, decent cell biologist, we can do that. We can generate cultures that are pretty clean for astrocytes, and we can transduce them. We had to choose outcome measures to determine how are we going to tell if an old astrocyte culture becomes young again. So we thought, started with the obvious, GFAP uh, intensity, and actually failed to show that that's a very reliable outcome for distinguishing an old from a young astrocyte population. It's confounded by tissue culture issues of density of cells and reactivity in a dish, and it's too messy, so we decided not to move forward with that. We looked at markers of proliferation, and sure enough, young cultures, but not old ones, have a whole bunch of proliferation in them. That's a nice way of telling an old from a young culture. We looked at responsive, uh, responsivity to rock inhibitors, and showed that young astrocytes look different when, they're, when rock is added to them than an old astrocyte. You can see that these two populations look vastly different, where you have this bipolar alignment of processes, where here you've got these star-shaped clusters of cells when an old astrocyte becomes reactive. We also looked at laminin expression. Young cultures express lots of laminin, old cut cultures don't. So that's another positive way of distinguishing young from old. <coughs> we also looked at dorsal root ganglion um, neurite outgrowth. So by plating dorsal root ganglia on top of cultures of young or old astrocytes, you can see that the processes are meager and few when a dorsal root ganglion is plated on an old astrocyte population, but very robust on young. So this is a nice way of quantitatively telling whether or not we're going to be reducing, um, reprogramming aged to young. And then lastly, migration. We did scratch assays through cultures, establish a culture, drag a knife through it, and you can see that after a period of time <clears throat> in young cultures, they migrate and fill the gap. The gap becomes really small. In old cultures, they don't. The gap stays quite large. So migration is another way of telling young from old. <clears throat> the paradigm here is that we dump on our, our cocktail of transcription factors to reprogram um, old to young, and then we challenge them with rock inhibitors to try to beat them up, see how they respond. And this is one of the real examples of taking a, uh, our old reactive astrocytes and after treatment um, reduce them to uh, young, immature astrocytes. But let me show you the evidence. We see phenotypic changes. So here's young and here's old. Here's old treated with our factors. And you can see that it looks quite a lot like the young astrocytes and very, very different from the aged old cells. So we believe that this is phenotypic evidence that we have reprogrammed them. And when we challenge these cultures with rock inhibitors, you can see that the way that they respond is more aligned and stellate, I'm sorry, aligned bipolar than it is this mismatch of uh, process outgrowth. <clears throat> We've shown with laminin expression that the uh, uh, treated, these are old and these are old and treated, that you get a lot more laminin expression in the old uh, cultures that have been reprogrammed. Again, suggesting that they have reverted to a um, immature state. Um, for the cognoscenti in the audience, I think that this is quite impressive given that a reprogram programming, as you know, has a very low efficiency. So our cultures are not thoroughly reprogrammed. There's only pockets. Yet despite that, in uh, whole field views, um, we're still detecting a very significant difference. We can also put DRGs on these cells and see tremendous amounts of outgrowth. And as I showed you earlier, this is a tremendous functional assay. Aged astrocytes do not support um, DRG outgrowth. Reprogrammed ones do. So it looks like we're getting a great deal more processes. And motility. If you scratch a, um, um, an old culture, it stays open. It does not knit together. But in reprogrammed uh, cultures, we actually get a knitting together and a tremendous amount of um, migration. So the, the distance here of this gap decreases significantly. <clears throat> Again, only pockets are um, reprogrammed. So here's 
a reprogrammed culture. And you can see this is quite typical. Some tie to knit together and others don't. So on average, you uh, don't see significance. You see it in pockets, as this indicates. Um, we've also started to take measures to increase efficiency by um, um, using shRNAs against p53, rb1, p19, or EGF, which increases the number of cells that are entering the cell cycle, making them more adaptive to reprogramming and um, uh, belaying the fear that these things will uh, uh, become tumorigenic. So that's um, what I've got so far. I think that what we've got here in this last uh, presentation or the last section of my presentation is some pretty suggestive evidence that we've created a cocktail that can reprogram old astrocytes into young, and they actually have a functional effect of causing greater neurite outgrowth. Now, it's all in a dish right now, so we're just moving this to animal models, but I'm pretty excited about it as a pretty novel approach to uh, CNS regeneration. Thank you very much.